Yeah, welcome back. Uh, before the break, we were looking at this mystery of God's will uh, that God had kept hidden through the ages. Now, from the very beginning, the Israelites always saw themselves as God's special chosen people. So God told them, keep yourself distinct from the other nations because you are a special nation dedicated unto me. Uh, so do not be like all the other nations. So the Israelites always took pride in this, that they were God's chosen people. Uh, God did marvelous miracles on their behalf. They had special privileges, which the other nations did not. Uh, when an when enemy, enemy came and attacked, it was uh, you know, on their behalf that God acted, not on behalf of the enemy. So uh, they always considered themselves as superior, as special, as chosen people. Uh, but all along, God had a secret plan. And he reveals it um, just in short you know, glimpses in the Old Testament. You know, in passages where it says, if anyone wishes to come and become part of the Israelite community, you know, they would have to undergo these uh, these uh, uh, rituals. And then uh, they would undergo the circumcision. And then after having completed all the rituals, that they can become part of the Israelite community. So all along, God did uh, reveal that he would like even other nations also to come and become part of the Israelite community. Uh, but um, he never uh, talked about how the entire world would one day become part of his kingdom. So these um, Israelites considered themselves as uh, having special citizenship rights to God's kingdom. But now God reveals uh, the, the his will, which he had kept a mystery throughout the ages. He openly reveals it and shows that this kingdom of God will not include just these chosen Jewish people. It will include all uh, Gentile communities as well. So now these special privileges which are being discussed in the book of Ephesians, in the letter to the Ephesians, these special privileges will not just apply to the Jewish people alone. It will apply to all of the believers. So uh, therefore, he begins by making it very clear that this special status of adoption that is being given is being given as equally to the Gentiles as it was offered to the Jewish believers. He wants them to understand that because after this, he's going to start talking about the privileges which they have, uh, you know, the, the special inheritance which they have received. So for them to grasp all of that, he wants to first establish this foundational truth that the Gentiles and the Jew, Jewish believers both have equal status now because of Christ. And um, so he says in verse 7, you know, Ephesians 1 verse 7, in him we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sins. Uh, it says that according to the riches of God's grace, uh, we all have been, um, you know, granted the good pleasure of, uh, of, 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 of being, you know, in him. So because now it says uh, in verse 10, he says, because God wanted to bring all things into unity under Christ. So having talked about all of that, uh, we will move into verses 11 uh, to maybe uh, 11 to 14, I suppose, would be enough. If we could just have someone read out for us. Uh, Ephesians 1 uh, verses 11 to 14, please. In him also we have obtained an inheritance, being predestined according to the purpose of him, who works all things according to the counsel of his will, that we who first trusted in Christ should be to the praise of his glory. In him you also trusted, after you heard the word of the gospel of your salvation, in whom also, having believed, you were sealed with the Holy Spirit of promise, who is the guarantee of our inheritance until the redemption of the purchased possession to the praise of his glory. Amen. Yeah. So he says, now those, those of us, you know, uh, uh, Jewish people who first placed our hope in Christ, yes, we are for the praise of his glory. You know, people will, will glorify God because of uh, the faith that we have placed in Christ. Uh, so uh, 
but he says you also in verse 13 he says you also were included in christ uh, so he says uh, now you too have been marked with the same seal which we were given so the jewish believers were given the seal of the holy spirit the same seal has now been extended even to the uh, gentile believers so the mystery of god's will is that all should be equally part of his kingdom and all will equally enjoy the spiritual blessings which are in christ jesus um uh, yeah okay there's a question here from jeffina who asks what about this term the fullness of the times in verse 10 how would we understand that so um god has um I mean, right before the foundation of the world god had already decided what would take place when uh so uh, he had decided that christ would come at a certain point of time and he would fulfill all things so uh, the god waited until that the fullness of the time had come when christ would come and do his work uh, for instance the things which god has planned for each of us in our lives you know the the, the day then uh, when you would probably get married the day when you will uh, you know uh, establish maybe a church in a new place the day when you you will, god will use you to mentor certain people all of each one of these things will take place when the fullness of time comes for that particular event so god waits god allows all the circumstances that are going to lead up to it to start taking place one by one he allows all these events to you know uh, uh, to um, to to set things in uh, you know uh, to set things in a particular way that when that moment finally comes when the fullness of time comes what god has planned for you what god has purposed for you for that particular uh, you, you know thing which he wants you to accomplish it will happen so regarding christ when the fullness of time the things which were meant to happen took place even in our own lives when the time comes when that fullness of time comes when everything that has that should happen to make that happen is all in place it will take place in god's timing so the term fullness of time is talking about how everything comes together all the circumstances are now in the right place all the people who are supposed to be part of that event are now you know uh, placed in the right positions and then when all of it is ready set what god has purposed for that particular life it will happen so over here of course it's specifically talking about the coming of christ and what he would do on the earth for us in uniting the jewish and gentile communities into one but then we can apply this term even in our own lives because sometimes we wonder and we ask ourselves why has this not happened yet i've been praying for it and nothing is happening that is because the fullness of time has not yet come god in his divine wisdom uh, will orchestrate events and people and circumstances and everything in such a way that everything comes together and everything is set in its right place and then god will release what he has planned so all we are supposed to do is stay faithful and continue praying that you know um, that will happen and that if there are any obstacles in the way we would cancel those in jesus name and we would wait for his timing for his purposes to take place in our uh, lives so the term it's a it's, a, it's just a old term, term a biblical term fullness of times which talks about that um uh, so it talks about the second coming of Christ. Like, mm -hmm. okay. Here in verse 10, does this term talk about uh, the second coming of Christ is what Jeffina is asking. Um, no, because everything was brought into unity uh, under Christ at the time of his, uh, you know, his completed atonement, work of atonement. And yes, at the end of times, then he will be established as a king over everything. But that is a, is a future event. At this point, all things have been placed under his, under his feet, under his authority. But he has not taken up complete kingship because he has allowed the prince of the air to still have his you know, uh, control for a little longer. So uh, that fullness of time has not happened yet. So it, uh, here verse 10 is not talking about uh, the fulfillment of the end time, you know, messianic rule and all of that. 
All right. Uh, so we were looking at how now Christ has brought even the Gentiles into his kingdom. And we have all been marked with the seal of the Holy Spirit. What is the, what's the term that is being used over here? That is just basically a mark that was placed on cattle in those days to show which particular cow belongs to whom. You know, which particular bull is the property of which man. Uh, so they would all have their own uh, markings, uh, maybe a kind of uh, icon which they have designed, and that would be branded onto the cattle. So uh, so that your sheep and your goats uh, and your cattle will not be stolen by somebody else because they will be brand. They'll be uh, bearing your brand of ownership. So uh, here. When it says that we have been sealed with the Holy Spirit, it's just basically talking about that. The principalities and parts, when they look at us, they can see the Holy Spirit inside us. So he is basically the mark of ownership. So the word seal, you know, all kinds of wrong uh, doctrines are brought out of this term seal. It just basically means mark of ownership. If you see a cow going down the road, and you want to know whose cow it is, you would look at the mark which is there on, which has been branded onto its skin. And then you would you would say, oh, okay, this cow belongs to so and so. In the same way, when we are going down the road, when we pass a temple, when we pass, you know, one of these different places of worship, the spirits which are there will look at us and ask, who's, who, whom does this person belong to? And they will see the Holy Spirit in, in, in us and they will realize, oh, this person is property of the Holy Spirit, not one of us doesn't belong to our kingdom. This person belongs to God's kingdom. So it's just a mark of ownership. So he's saying, look, this is the status which has been given to us believers. We literally bear the mark of God's ownership through the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit in us serves as, uh, you know, it, uh, it, it, it establishes, the Holy Spirit establishes to all the principalities and powers that we belong to him that we belong to God. So that is the high status that has been given to us. And not only is he this mark of ownership, he is also a deposit guaranteeing our inheritance. So um, because people may think, how, how is it possible for us to really have all of these spiritual blessings? Really, I mean, is it true? Is God bluffing? I mean, is he really going to release all of his spiritual blessings to us? Uh, can we actually access all of it and you know enjoy all of it? So if, because people may be having such doubts, God says, the Holy Spirit has been given to you as a deposit to guarantee that, yes, you will receive all of the blessings. Uh, it's like a very rich billionaire making a promise to someone and saying, you know, I'm going to be giving you... Uh, uh, let us say 10 million, you know, I'm going to give you 10 million euros is, is the promise that he makes. Now, 10 million euros is a very large amount. Uh, so that person may think, oh, will this man really keep his word? Will he really give me 10 million euros? So the man would, the rich man will probably say, look, I will give you one, one uh, million right now as a guarantee that the other nine also will come to you in the right time. So that one million becomes like a deposit, guaranteeing the rest of the amount as well. So the Holy Spirit has been given to us as a guarantee that all of the rest of the spiritual blessings which are meant to be ours will come to us. So how do we stand on this truth in a time of sickness that we are facing, in a time of financial need that we have, in a time when ministry is, uh, you know, um, uh, we are struggling in the ministry and we do not know how to make progress at such times we come to the Lord and say Lord when the principalities and powers look at me they immediately see that I am owned by you I literally have your Holy Spirit living in me and you also have been given to me the Holy Spirit has been given to me as a deposit guaranteeing all the spiritual blessings we talked about in verse, I think it was in verse 3, you know, where we talked about all the spiritual blessings in Christ. So this Holy Spirit has been given to us to guarantee that all of the spiritual blessings will be ours, you know, as and when we claim them. 
So we can go to the Lord and say, because the Holy Spirit is the guarantee that I will have all of these blessings released to me what I need for my ministry so that I can make progress, I can bring people into your kingdom. Release the healing which I require in my body so that I can serve you further and honor you in the way that I live. You know, so that this sickness will not distract me away from the things which I am meant to accomplish. So when you go to the Lord with the right motives and, and place your requests before them, before him, whether it is for healing or whether it is for uh, financial needs or whether it's regarding ministry matters, the Lord will answer because that Holy Spirit who is living in us is the guarantee that we will be given everything else as well. The other things will not be denied to us. All the other spiritual blessings will also be given to us. So these are scriptures that we can claim if we have understood what they are talking about, uh, about what is what privilege is being given to us through these promises. So it's important to understand these things. Then verses 15 to 20, he talks about the um, the how we need to understand the status which has been given to us. So this is pointless. I mean, a man who has been given uh, 10 million euros, if he doesn't understand the privilege that has been given to him, he'll continue to live like a pauper. He will he will not make use of those 10 million euros, you know, to uh, to advance himself and uh, you know to make his uh, position better in life, because he has not even understood the value of those uh, 10 million euros. So here uh, in verses 15 to 20, this is what Paul says, so that these believers will understand what is granted to them. If you could have someone read out for us, uh, verse 15 to 20, please. Therefore, I also, after I heard of your faith in the Lord Jesus and your love for all the saints, do not cease to give thanks for you, making mention of you in my prayers, that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory, may give to you the spirit of wisdom and revelation in the knowledge of him, the eyes of your understanding being enlightened, that you may know what is the hope of his calling, what are the riches of the glory of his inheritance in the saints, and what is the exceeding greatness of his power toward us who believe according to the working of his mighty power, which he worked in Christ when he raised him from the dead and seated him at his right hand, even the uh, he heavenly places. Amen. Yes. So uh, here, after having talked a little bit about the status which we believers now possess, after having talked a little bit about all the uh, treasures which can be ours, he says, you know, you need to understand this. You need to grasp what I have said. Because if you don't grasp what has been said, you'll continue living the same way you have always lived. You will not access these uh, blessings and this inheritance which has been given to you. Therefore, he says, this is the prayer that I have been praying for you guys. I have been praying that the Lord would give you his spirit of wisdom and revelation. So when the Holy Spirit grants us wisdom and revelation, what will happen? It will light up the eyes of our heart. Our heart will suddenly finally start seeing these, these uh, spiritual truths. So when the Holy Spirit gives us his wisdom and revelation, it will light up the eyes of our heart and we will begin to see four things. First, you know, we will get to start knowing this Jesus better. So knowing him better will be the first thing that we, we will start growing in. The second thing is we will start knowing the hope to which we have been called, that that will start increasing. Third, all the riches of the glorious inheritance our understanding of that will start increasing. And fourthly, the power which is available to us, you know, to, uh, to be able to accomplish all that God wants us to do, that we will be able to grasp more and more. So through the work of the Holy Spirit, through the wisdom and revelation which he will give to us, our eyes will be enlightened to start and I uh, know accessing these four aspects of what we have in Christ. It all begins with knowing him better. As long as somebody is a stranger 
as long as you don't really know them too well, you can never completely, totally trust them. It's only when that relationship starts growing closer and closer and the bond deepens, then you are in a position to trust that person completely. That person were to say, write all your, you know, your entire, uh, all your bank accounts, all, all the money in your bank account, write, write it into my name and turn it over to me because you trust me. You will be willing to do that because now you trust that person so much. You know that they, that person will not cheat you. You know that that person will not betray you. It's it's like that in our relationship with the Lord. We have to grow in our knowledge of Him. By that, I do not mean head knowledge. It has to be a very intimate, personal, experiential knowledge where we start getting to know the Lord more and more. And the more we know Him, whatever He asks us, however ridiculous it may sound, we will be willing to just give it to Him because now we trust Him that much. We know that He will not betray our interests. So uh, getting to know Him is the first uh, thing that we need to access. The second that uh, you know uh, th that is important for us to gain all our treasures is to understand the hope to which he has called us. We have been called to a very high hope. We have been called to live as uh, children of the King of Kings. So we are not just um, second class humans, rather we are children of royalty. That is the eternal hope to which we have been called. On this earth, we will face persecutions, but in all of those persecutions, we literally have the king of kings with us, you know, protecting us, enabling us, equipping us, helping us to uh, accomplish great things in spite of the opposition against us. There's a great hope to which we have been called and that we will start realizing the, st the status and the position we have when we start growing, you know, in this uh, wisdom and revelation which the spirit will impart to us. The third thing that is very, very important for us to grasp is the riches of his glorious inheritance. So uh, in our time of sickness, in our time of need, in our time of struggle, uh, you know, whether it's personal struggles, ministry struggles, uh, relationship struggles, in all of this, if we do not understand the riches which are available to us through his glorious inheritance, we will not be able to access them. So we need to start understanding how rich we are, not just at head knowledge level, but we know it so deeply where we will be able to stand boldly before the throne and claim it and say, Lord, I know this is mine. The Holy Spirit has said to me that this is mine. Now I've come to, I, I know, take it. And the Lord will give it because, you know, you have now believed to that extent. Uh, so, uh, so we need to know the riches of his glorious inheritance. The fourth thing, were in mentioned in verse 19, the incomparably great power that is now available. It's that same power which raised Jesus from the dead. That same divine power has now been granted to us to live the kind of life that God has planned for us. Now, uh, people take these four things and they apply them only to material things, which is a rather sad way to approach this passage because over here, uh, uh, Maybe we should look at this passage more in the light of, you know, um, Matthew 6.33, where it says, if your focus is on advancing the kingdom of God and living in righteousness, if that is your focus, all these things will be added to you. All the material things which you require will in any way be added to you. So um, rather than reducing these four great things which are being offered over here, you know, in this passage, reducing them and saying, oh, I want to know him better so that I can have a car. You know, I, I, uh, the hope to which he has called me is that I will be a very successful, influential businessman. You know, rather than just simply reducing all of this to mere material things, they rather say, Lord, you, are, you, you have given us your wisdom and revelation to understand these four things better and to access them to a deeper extent so that I can become all that I'm meant to be in you so that I can really fulfill all the purposes you have for my life. And even as you're doing all of that, whatever you require at the material level will be given to you anyway. Because those are not, those are very easy for the Lord to give. It hardly takes any effort for him to give. Rather, he would have us growing into the uh, person that he wants us to be. And while we are focused on that, on honoring him, pleasing him, fulfilling his purposes, whatever we require at the material level will anyway be given, given to us. 
So this is a prayer which a lot of people pray over themselves, um, you know, this particular passage. So maybe we can also do that, you know, where we would actually go down, kneel down in God's presence, and we would say, Lord, through your Holy Spirit, grant me wisdom and revelation because I want to know you better. I want to start knowing you to an extent where I can just trust you completely and do whatever you're asking me to do. Lord, grant me your wisdom and revelation so that I can start knowing you in this intimate way. Second, help me to really understand the great hope to which I have been called. I have not been called to just be a businessman or to be a successful teacher or um, to, you know, to, to run a large church. There's a greater hope to which you have called me. I am meant to accomplish so much, you know, influence so many lives. And I want you, to, I want to start understanding all this hope to which you have called me. I want to start understanding what I am meant for, what you have placed me for on this earth. So grant me your wisdom and revelation so that I may know this more. Third, you would ask in the same way that he would help you to become aware of how rich you are so that we will not have a poor person mentality, but rather we would think, you know, like uh, children of royalty. You know? So um, and the fourth, we would all that we would have an awareness of the great power that is available to us if we are willing to use it for God's purposes, you know, for uh, to, to, to bring down the the dark forces which are trying to stop our ministry, if we use his power to release the funds which we need to make advances for his kingdom, if we uh, want to use this power to release healing into the, into the bodies of sick people so that they can rise up and glorify God and build his kingdom. You know, so as long as our focus is on his priorities, all that we require will be made available to us because this Holy Spirit has been given to us as a guarantee to, to guarantee the fact that all the rest of the spiritual blessings are ours. They will be given to us if we will go and submit our check, you know, and at the counter and say, Lord, I have come to claim what is mine and the Lord will give you what is yours. So this prayer would help us to grow deeper into this wisdom and revelation that God is offering so that we can have an awareness of these things and be able to access them more and more. Um, yeah. So um, in verses 21, 22, 23, it talks about the, uh, the position of lordship which has been now uh, given to Jesus Christ, you know, because he has uh, uh, conquered the principalities and powers, defeated them on the cross, uh, become our representative and lifted us to uh, to be with him, seated with him. So because he has done all this, these things, he is right now in this particular position of authority where he is above all rule and authority, above all powers and dominions, above every name that is invoked, it says in verse 21. That's what it says. So, you know, people call upon all kinds of names. Uh, they call upon all kinds of spirits and they invoke the power of those spirits. But we who just simply stand on the name of Jesus and say, Jesus, help me in my situation, we are invoking a much greater name than the names of all these other powers. So that is the position in which Christ has been placed. And the remarkable thing is in verse 22, where it says, God placed all things under his feet and appointed him to be head over everything for the church. I mean, because you, God always was in a position of authority and dominion. He always was sovereign. He always was ruler. He came down to the lowest level so that he can become our representative, become one of us, live with us, die for us, and then lift us up to his level. So all these things which have been placed under the feet of Jesus, it's not like as if he didn't have these things already at his bid and call. He already had been sovereign uh, you know, uh, ruler through the infinite ages. Christ came down to our level, became nothing, emptied himself and became one of us. And now he has risen back to his position and things have been placed under his feet. Why? For us or on, on our behalf so that we can go to him and claim things in Jesus' name and it will be done to us, done for us. So... It is basically for us that he has done all of this. 
So therefore, it, it says, and it says, goes on to say in verse 23, um, for the church, which is his body, the fullness of him who fills everything in every way. So we, the church, are literally the body of Christ. All that Christ has now won for us, we, are, we get to enjoy it, we get to partake in it. So after having done this letter to the Ephesians, you know, after we have completed it, it should lead to a greater, more victorious walk in the Lord. If that does, if that does not happen at the end of you know our uh, sessions on the uh, letter to the Ephesians, it means that we have not grasped what was um, revealed to us in this letter. On the other hand, it may be that we have not believed all that we have read because it's, it seems so extravagant. It seems too big to believe, which is why the Holy Spirit was given as a guarantee, as a deposit, so that we will believe. The 1 million euros has been given to you so that you, so that you will believe that the other 9 million is also coming to you. So let this letter to the Ephesians change our mindset about the status that we have whether we are Gentile believers or Jewish believers, um, we have now been given this new status. And Jesus Christ did all of this so that everything can be placed under his feet for ourselves, for us, for the church, which is his body, the fullness of him, is what it says over here. Okay, so uh, Ephesians should have a should lead to a change in our uh, lifestyle. And of course, in the you know, in chapters five, chapter six. Uh, it talks about how we should be living so that we can access it. If we continue living like you know uh, slaves to sin, then we will not enjoy these privileges. So the later portion of Ephesians talks about the lifestyle that we should be living so that we can actually enjoy these spiritual blessings so that we can be very, very rich in the Lord, so that we will not have to be poor and we'll not be begging always for things. You know, God will be there giving us all we require because uh, we are focused on our status and we are walking in that status. Uh, so kind of having introduced the subject, now he moves into chapter two, uh, where he talks about uh, how we should um, you know, start behaving. So he starts off by telling what our uh, new character is. Earlier, we were sinful people. Now, we are a different kind of people and because now we are a different kind of people we can access all of these riches which are available to us in christ so he starts off by impressing on his readers the new status that they have regard in, in with regard to spiritual matters they should not be living as slaves anymore rather they should start living in a different way so to bring out that he starts um, you know talking about certain things in chapter two um so yes, uh, if we could have someone read out for us uh, chapter. OK, we have success who has raised his hand. Uh, success, you can unmute and go ahead. Oh, uh, Good morning. Good morning, good morning yeah. ma'am. Yeah, uh, please, I want to, uh, I'm having a problem to log in things. I went through my email, I saw the link, but the link wasn't connected. And my WhatsApp is having issue. Just now I rectified the issue. I, I don't mm -hmm. know if they can be sending the, the link to email so that we can be able, because the one we sent to email cannot be, it's not connecting, it's not working. So I don't know if there, there's any way they can also adjust so that we can link through our Google class because I've been working since uh, to try to join, I could not be able to join because the link on email is different from the link on WhatsApp. Okay. Um maybe i can deal with this issue after the class so that next class onwards you will not have a problem um, yeah uh, so i'll see what i can do after the class is done today's thank class all right so next time onwards hopefully you will not have any problem okay. all right thank you so much yeah. Yeah. so yes we uh, if we could have someone read out for us in uh, chapter 2 um, maybe verses 1 to 5 um, Ephesians chapter 2, verses 1 to 5, please. And you he made alive who were dead in trespasses, trespasses and sins, in which you once walked according to the course of this world, according to the prince of the power of the air, the spirit who now works in the sons of disobedience, among whom also we all once conducted ourselves 
in the lusts of our flesh, fulfilling the desires of the flesh and of the mind, and were by nature children of wrath, just as the others. But God, who is rich in mercy, because of his great love, with which he loved us, even when we were dead in trespasses, made us alive together with Christ. By grace you have been saved. Yes. So he talks about the uh, high status which we have. We were people who were dead in our transgressions and sins, is what it says in chapter 2, verse 1. No, we, we were spiritually dead and we were slaves to sin. We were slaves to uh, the powers of the air. Because in verse 2, it talks about the ruler of the kingdom of the air. It's basically talking about Satan and his evil spirits uh, who are now at work among those who are disobedient. So we also were under the subjugation of these spirits. That was our status. But now, look at the new status that has been given to us. Um, it says that because of his uh, great love and because he is rich in mercy, we have been made alive with Christ. In verse 5 it says that we have been made alive with Christ. And not just that, verse 6 goes on to say, God raised us up with Christ and seated us with him in the heavenly realms in Christ Jesus. So once upon a time, we were dead spiritually. We were slaves. We were under the rulers of the air. But now we have been made alive. We are no longer dead. We have been made alive. And now, uh, whereas earlier we were under the, those, uh, uh, the spirits of the air, we are now above the spirits of the air because we have been raised up with Christ and are now seated with him in the heavenly realms. So people who were slaves are now ruling over their slave masters. That's basically the, you know, the point that is being brought out over here. We were helpless, just like the rest of the world. We could not uh, resist the evil forces. You know, uh, uh, people with addictions could not come out of their addictions because the spirits were controlling them. People who were worldly minded uh, could not focus on spiritual uh, matters because uh, their minds were bogged down by, by you know, material things. Now we have been brought out of all of that. We are no longer slaves to any of that. Now we are seated with Christ in the heavenly uh, realms. And so now we can think differently. We can act differently. These things which, which used to control us and crush us, we can now crush them. We can now, in, in the name of Jesus, tell them what they should be doing, you know, to back off, uh, to, uh, to, to not interfere in the purposes of God in our lives. So. We who were slaves are now ruling over our slave masters. We have gained authority over our old slave masters. That is the privilege that has been given to us. Um, so uh, the contrast he, he draws between what we were and what we are today. He, he, and then he says in verse uh, 8 and 9, For it is by grace you have been saved uh, through faith. And this is not from yourselves. It is the gift of God, not by works, so that no one can boast. So all these privileges have now become ours. This high status you know, of ours, where we are even controlling the, our old slave masters, where we can now crush our old slave masters, all of these privileges have been given simply because we placed our faith in this Jesus Christ. And he says, even this faith which you have placed in Jesus Christ, that also is a gift. It's not something that you were able to create on your own. You didn't come up with that faith on your own. The, uh, the Holy Spirit gave you that faith so that you will be able to trust this Jesus. So even the faith which you have been given, as a result of which you know all these privileges have come to you, even that basic first step of faith, that also is a gift which uh, the Holy Spirit granted. So, uh, in other words, Paul is saying, no, everything that we require for a successful life, everything that we require for a victorious life has been granted to us in Christ Jesus. So these are all very uh, high promises that are being made, you know, a very high status which is being talked about here in this book of, uh, in, in this letter to the Ephesians. Um, 
Now let us look at uh, verses 10 to 13. So Ephesians chapter 2, verses 10 to 13, if someone could read out. For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. Therefore, remember that you, once Gentiles in flesh, who are called uncircumcision by what is called the circumcision made in the flesh by hands, that at that time you were without Christ, being aliens from the commonwealth of Israel and strangers from the covenants of promise, having no hope and without God in the world, but now in Christ, but now in Christ Jesus, you once, you who once were far off, have been brought near by the blood of Christ. Now he's specifically speaking to the Gentiles, and he says, uh, "Your status was, you know, if if you know, if you were to say that the Jewish people were in a you know, were in a stage or a state of slavery under the under the spirits of the air." If, if you if you were to say that that was their status, as for you Gentiles, Gentile status was even worse. They had been separated from Christ. They were excluded from citizenship in Israel. Uh, it says that they were without hope, without God. At least the Israelites could claim that you know they were God's special people, even though they were living in sin and they were not using the privileges which were theirs. Uh, at least the Jewish people, maybe they could claim that they had that. The Gentiles didn't even have that. They had, it says very plainly in verse 12, it says they were without hope, without God in the world. That was the condition they were in. So now all of these people have been brought near by the blood of Christ. Both the Jewish people and the Gentiles have been brought close to God. Those who were strangers, those who were separated from God, those who had no you know, hope of citizenship in the kingdom of God. Now they all have been brought near by the blood of Christ. Uh, he goes on to talk about how Jesus Christ, you know, has broken down the barrier that is there between the Jewish uh, Jewish people and the Gentile people. He talks about that, but just to you know, focus a little bit on this verse ten, we because we talked about all the privileges which we have. Now, why has all that been given to us? Verse ten puts things in perspective uh, because sometimes we forget verse ten and we only think about the privileges which we have. Verse ten explains that we are God's handiwork created in Christ Jesus to do good works which God prepared in advance for us to do. So all of this which has been granted to us, the spiritual blessings which are freely being given to us, it's so that we can do the good works for which God first of all created us. The purpose with which he placed us on this earth. That word over there that is used, the Greek word for handiwork, it really talks about uh, somebody who's designing something with his hands. So it's like God took each individual person and designed an exclusive, specific, specific, special life for them. They will be doing certain things which nobody else will be doing. They will be fulfilling certain uh, callings and purposes, you know, which have not been given to someone else. So that person has been specifically designed. That's the word handiwork over there with his hands. He has designed for each person, each believer in a particular way so that they will do the good works for which he uh, you know, has uh, placed them on the earth. It says God prepared in advance for us to do. So even before you were born, God planned these things for you and he designed you so that you will be able to fulfill those things. And now his riches, his incomparable power, his very presence so that you will know him and grow Deeper, deeper in a relationship with him, all of this has been released to you so that you can fulfill those good works. So nothing actually standing between you and your calling. Yes, of course, a position will come from the earth, from the spirits of the air, all of that, yes. And then uh, in the, the latter part of Ephesians will also teach us how to overcome those things. But uh, basically, you know, speaking, bottom line, what God has planned for you, the purposes for your life which he has planned, he has also now imparted the riches and the power which you require to be able to achieve those good works. So uh, 
now from your side what you need to do is go and stand before the throne with confidence and claim what is yours uh, on a daily basis because that's basically what hebrews 4 is talking about where it says in your time of the need um, uh, for the things that you require the grace that you require for that day all those things are granted to you before that throne so we have to go there and claim what's requ required on a daily basis and every day we will be able to accomplish the purposes for which god has placed us here because the power for, for that the riches for that has now been released to us it is now made available to us we can go up to this to that bank and claim what is ours on a daily basis by faith so uh, uh, in verse 14 onwards, he talks about how the Gentiles and the Jews have now been made one. The dividing wall of hostility that existed between the two communities has been broken down. And now we all enjoy the same status. So over here, uh, you know, it, it's actually referring to that wall of hostility that actually physically, you know, existed between the Jewish and Gentile communities in, uh, in Jerusalem. Because we, we, the temple, uh, the holy place, the most holy place, the inner courts, all of these uh, were reserved for the Jewish community. Only they could go inside the inner courts and all of that. You know? uh, now, so around the, the, the basic main temple structure and the inner courts, uh, a wall of hostility was built, a boundary wall was built, so that Gentiles will not go inside. So the Gentiles could only stay in the outer court. So um, this was a four and a half foot high barrier that was built around the um, inner courts. And it says that, uh, you know, we, we, we basically know this from the uh, from Josephus, you know, the, the historical records which he had written at that time. Uh, all along this boundary wall, 13 stone slabs were placed on which the warning was written saying that Gentiles should not dare to cross this point because if they do so, a death sentence can be given against them. So that was the seriousness of this boundary wall. The Gentiles could not even hope to enter in. And now that dividing wall of hostility has been broken down by Jesus Christ. So uh, he has brought together both the communities and now both the communities enjoy the rich privileges and riches which are which have been made available in Christ. So um, this is the status that we have. So he says in verse 17 and verse 18, um, he came and preached peace to you who were far away and peace to those who were near. So both communities now have peace with God the Father. They can have equal access to the Father through the spirit. It says by one spirit, both have access to the father by one spirit. Consequently, you are no longer foreigners and strangers, but fellow citizens with God's people and also members of his household. Um, uh, and uh, so, you know, the letter ends by talking about Jesus Christ as being the chief cornerstone. So when you are laying the found, you, have, you know, you have dug into the ground, and now you're laying the foundation for the building. The building has not yet come up. You're still laying the foundation. So when you start building the foundation, you first put down one import, one, one main stone. That becomes the chief cornerstone. The rest of the foundation, uh, you will build it with reference to this one main stone which has been put over there. How much should each of the other stones be placed? At what distance should they be placed from this main chief cornerstone? Because that becomes the main measure by which all the placement of all the other foundation stones will be placed. So all the steps that they take in building the rest of the foundation, it will all be centered around this cornerstone against which everything else will be measured and placed in its correct positions. So now Jesus Christ is this chief cornerstone who has brought both the communities together. He has placed the believers now in certain positions, you know, because he's the chief cornerstone. He determines where all the other stones should go. And so in that way, the apostles and the prophets and these early leaders, they became the foundation 
And then the church building started to grow on top of that, where each individual believer is like one stone in the walls of the building which is coming up. And the foundation is the leaders that God has appointed. Uh, you know, and uh, so Jesus Christ and the leaders are together helping this church to now grow. And so now we all have a role to play in the way this kingdom of God is built. You know, so we all get to participate in it. That's the privilege that has been given to us. Uh, so uh, let's just close with a brief word of prayer, please. We thank you, O oh Lord, that we have uh, been able to touch a little upon the high status that has now been given to us. And we also realize that now there are responsibilities attached to this high status. You created us, O oh Lord, designed us for very specific good works that we should be doing in our lives. So we pray that we will access the riches that are made available to us. We will access the incomparable power that has been released to us. And we will use it to accomplish those good works for which you have placed us here, O oh Lord. We pray that we would uh, live in a way that would please you, honor you, and we will be able to achieve, accomplish all the purposes that you have for our lives, O oh Lord. Lord, even as we um, uh, reflect on the things that we have studied today in Ephesians, and even as we go through the rest of the letter, we pray, O oh Lord, that these realities would become very, very real to us personally, so that we can become the handiwork that you created us to be, O oh Lord. Thank you, Lord. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Thank you.